Today on This Week in Space, astronomer Steve Fentress talks about the new green comet in our skies. Join us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 45, recorded January 20th, 2023, A Creepy Green Comet. Hey everybody, it's time for the Twit Audience Survey. This annual survey helps us understand our audience so we can make your listening experience even better. It only takes a few minutes. Go to twit.tv slash survey23 to take it. That's twit.tv slash survey23. Don't wait. The last day to take the survey is January 31st. Thanks. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Creepy Green Comet Edition. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and I'm joined by the Umbregas Tarek Malik, Editor-in-Chief of Space.com. Hiya, Tarek. And no, I don't know what that means. It was just a cool I was gonna, word. I was going to say, I'm going to have to get the dictionary out, Rod. Well, that's, a, that's a new <laughs> one for me. So. Umbregas. I, I, I like it, though. I, I, don't, so. I don't think it's completely complimentary, but but it was a U word, so I, so I grabbed it. And, and we're that's joined my new today. band name. Oh, yeah. The Umbregas <laughs> Five. We're joined today by my old pal, Steve Fentress, formerly of the Griffith Observatory and quite wisely having moved on to his current post as the Planetarium Director of the Rochester Museum and Science Center in Rochester, New York. Hiya, Steve. Um, nice to talk to you all. Uh, Long time listener, first time guester. <laughs> welcome, that sounds welcome like aboard. coast to coast. Welcome aboard. You'll be sorry you did. Uh, so before we begin, <laughs> With great optimism, I have a new space joke from listener Benji Kirk. Is everybody ready? Uh, yes, yes. Lay it on me. Okay. Lay it on me, Rod. Did you hear about Orion's belt? It's a waste of space. W-A-I-S-T. <laughs> Three stars at most. <laughs> I love <laughs> I, got, ooh, I got two root shots today. Three stars. That's the first time most. I've heard that one. First time I've heard that one today. <laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> Planetarium directors get all the all the space jokes and, and give out the best of them. Well, that was for you, Steve, since you're an astro dude. Uh, Thank maybe you'll so you want to put that put that in the forward of your next edition of your new book, Sky to Space, Astronomy Beyond the Basics with Comparisons, Ratios, and Proportions. And I wanted to get the product placement in early, so there you go. Um, Thank you. For it's, every, it's on for Amazon. Every, Yes, it is. And it's a fine book. I've seen it. And besides being an astronomer and a planetarium lecturer and all the other things you do, you're also a heck of an artist and uh, drew all those illustrations yourself. So thumbs up to you. Um, before we get rolling here, I invite you to join Team Tarek and send us your best or worst space joke for uh, nothing. Actually, we just read it on the air and we give you credit, but it's, <laughs> it's how we like to roll here. So send, send us what you got. And don't forget to do us a solid. Make sure to like, subscribe, and all that cool podcast stuff to our podcast, because after all, we're not charging you anything, so what more could you expect? All right, well, let's roll right into some headlines. Uh, the first one I like to call the nuclear-powered planet. This is an exoplanet recently discovered, HD 206893C. It's an exoplanet with fusion at its core, which is kind of interesting. It's about 13 times the size of Jupiter which puts it teetering between simple uber planet or a brown dwarf star, 130 light years from Earth, and was detected by the Gaia spacecraft. Tarek, what do you know? Yeah, yeah, this was a really fun one because it's kind of like this weird hybrid. We like to call them the 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 failed stars, the mystery objects, you know, that, that are out there in space. And basically this was a big confirmation of Europe's Gaia space telescope, which was, you know, scanning the, the universe. And um, it found signs of this planet around its star HD 206893. It's about 130 light years uh, from earth. And, uh, and basically astronomers went through that Gaia data and 
uh, decided, hey, we're going to look at this with the very large telescope that's out at the um, uh, at the uh, European Southern Observatory in the Atacama Desert in Chile, and they and they wanted to double check, like, did uh, did Gaia actually find this this planet there or not? And by going through all this data and and double checking, they were able to confirm that it's there, and so that's why it has that little moniker at the end, two oh six eight nine three C. So it's like the the third object that they've seen there. And uh, but they were able to also see bits of its atmosphere. So they they can see some weird stuff going on there. And they saw it brighten and dim over time, which is what really clued them in that there's something going on at its core. And they think that it's got this fusion like our sun, right? Uh, but by pulsing almost like a heartbeat uh, on this planet. And uh, and they're really thrilled about it because they they're they very rarely see this kind of inter this interstage, this interstitial stage between stars and planets, and they think that uh, that it may it may in fact be uh, that bridge between you know how Jupiter, which is the biggest planet in our solar system, never got to that stage of becoming a star or a brown dwarf. And here they can see an example of that and see uh, see how stars might be forming in uh, in action there. So it's pretty exciting to see. It's a weird too. Well, weird is the greatest compliment we've got. <laughs> Steve, are brown dwarfs pretty common in uh, observation? Well, they're hard to find. I mean, they're the kind of things that you look for with infrared light. So this is why infrared is sort of one of the keys to the future of astronomy. And and so new telescopes, unless they're dedicated to looking at something else, you're going to, you've got JWST, which is definitely made for infrared. Um, and they're going to mm. be more after that. And, and that, that that's, a really interesting wavelength range for seeing things that are not hot enough to glow like stars, but have interesting things going on. All right. Well, let's chalk it up to one more exoplanet that we never want to put our feet on. And that one, that one is from space.com. I forgot to mention that at the, at the rip there. <laughs> so. Yes. Thank you. As is the next one. So we have another Martian meteorite. This is one of the few large announcements, large-ish announcements, uh, since the Allen Hills possible life fossils found in meteorite <laughs> announcement done in the 90s. Oh, we don't, which turned we don't out, talk about Alan. Uh, <laughs> yeah, kind of controversial. And there was a study, I guess, just came out last year that said, yeah, we're pretty sure this was geological in origin. So too bad because they looked like little cool worms. Anyway, this new one, which was found in Morocco in 2011, is unique. I mean, Martian meteorites are fairly rare anyway. And it's it's the closest thing to Mars sample return we've had so far and will have until the early 2030s. But um, this is a rock that came in that has five different kinds of organics inside, one new uh, to Mars at any rate, as far as we've observed, which is um, the derivation of magnesium. So this is nature sample return, thought to be an early igne igneous rock from Mars, probably formed by geological processes, but still of interest because, of course, where you have organics, you might have critters someday. So um, <laughs> it's a habitability uh, question. Anything you want to add, Tart? Well, yeah, and, and you mentioned that, that this was that space.com, but also our, our sister publication, Live Science, um, right. uh, did pick it up. And this is kind of where I was reading. And you know, the really interesting thing to me is that this meteorite, the Tissant meteorite, and it's called that because it, it, it broke apart over uh, the, the city of Tissant in Morocco, uh, but it's only one of five uh, Mars meteorites that people have seen actually fall to Earth. So people saw this happen, and then they went out and they looked for it, and they found the meteorites, and then they were able to determine that they were from Mars. And now they've got this uh, this new insight that it has these these organic or organic. Oh my gosh, that's like Leah Organa. No, organic organic compounds um, uh, in them from Mars. And of course, the, the the question always is: Is there life on Mars? Was there ever uh, life on Mars? And um, and this is a, a really nice concrete study that says there was at least these these building blocks of of life in the geology of of the planet and it's fairly definitive this wasn't nasa throwing together a big press conference in the 90s uh with the allen hills meteorite and saying hey look we found it and then coming back a little bit later and rolling it back in a pretty embarrassing fashion this is not uh what that was at all and some could say that that really colored a lot of the the uh the follow-up studies uh, about it that we've seen back and forth this is this is you know like another another notch in the story of what that geology was whether or not these compounds were made you know through geologic terms or organics or living you know like, like microbes or whatnot you know they can't see that yet and and that's another reason why 
uh, NASA and other agencies wanted to send astronauts there because they could do a lot of the science a lot faster uh, and more capable robots that would have better tools to look for signs of life. So it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a big clue into that early environment. Uh, it's very old rock. So you know, the hundreds of millions of years ago, uh, we would like to know if are those compounds still there right now, and what does it mean for Mars right now? Steve, we had a, when we were working together at Griffith, there was a huge meteorite collection there. And I remember some of them being fairly sizable, at least basketball sized or larger. Are those still there, do you know, or did they leave when Ron Aridi left? I think some of them are still there. They have quite a nice set of solar system displays in the new basement. And there are some of the meteorites there. Um, and those those would tend to emphasize the the nickel iron meteorites that are the easiest ones to find, so they're the most common in collections. Um, I don't know whether there's a Martian meteorite or there may be a little lunar meteorite in there. Martian, I'm not sure. I don't think we had a a, a strongly suspected Martian meteorite at the time that collection was put together. Mm. All right, and last up. The dramatically named story, SpaceX capsule to be five-person lifeboat in event of ISS emergency. Um, that's kind of misrepresentative, but uh, <laughs> in the in the case that there is an emergency on the International Space Station at this time, as of right now, we have a problem because, of course, the Soyuz capsule that's docked there along with the Crew Dragon capsule sprung a leak and spewed its coolant into space rather dramatically back in de December. So um, we don't have a way to get everybody home right now unless we just jam them into that capsule and cross our fingers and hope that the Soyuz is going to make it back with no coolant. So steps have been taken, one of which is to install an extra seat in that SpaceX Dragon capsule, um, which would allow them to bring back a total of five in that. So that would bring back all the Americans, and then that would leave two Russians to go back in the Soyuz, which they feel is more manageable because it's... I guess less of a draw on the cooling system, right? Yeah, yeah. And this is uh, this is from space.com. My my good friend uh, Mike Wall uh, picked this one up earlier this week, and and essentially this is an evolution of the discussions that NASA and Russia and SpaceX had had uh, when they were trying to figure out their contingency scenarios uh, because of the stricken Soyuz MS twenty two spacecraft docked at the station right now. It lost all of its its coolant, as we just we've discussed in, in past episodes. And so what they're what they did. Um, uh, this week, actually, is they had Frank Rubio, the NASA astronaut, who is part of this three uh, three man crew of the Soyuz, move his seat liner. This is like a customized uh, seat liner that they put in the Soyuz that he sits on. It cushions him on the way down uh, for landing, and they they figured out a way to to mount that inside the the Dragon uh, cargo area. There's room for that, so they move some stuff around, uh, and so now they'll have five seats instead of the four that they launched with. Uh, in the really like rare scenario that they're going to have to evacuate the space station, and they don't have uh, an effective Soyuz there, they really don't think that that's going to be required. Uh, but they wanted to at least have this um, this contingency set up uh, just in case until Russia sends a new Soyuz, an empty one, in February. Uh, to take the place of the broken one that's up there right now, and and it it basically it limits the 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 risk to the astronauts uh, that are in uh, in the Soyuz uh, by having two people there instead of three. The heat load of the Soyuz on the Soyuz itself because you've got two bodies instead of three, um, and uh, and basically it means that the cosmonauts uh, Sergey uh, Prok I'm going to get this uh, wrong. I apologize in advance. Sergey Prokopiev and Dmitry Patelin. Uh, you know, we'll have uh, at least, you know, a, a dedicated way to get back, um, uh, if not very comfortable. It could get up to 100 degrees inside there uh, in, in the six hours it would take to get back to the Earth. Um, and that's kind of the working scenario right now. But uh, in February, a new Soyuz will be launched there. They'll have that there. What we found out this week, too, is that NASA thinks that they're going to come back to Earth, Frank Rubio and these two cosmonauts, at the end of September of 2023. They launched at the end of September in 2022, which means that they're looking at potentially an entire year, an actual calendar year, as opposed to the um, the, the the recent NASA quote unquote one year flights that were a few weeks shy of that mark. They're looking at uh, uh, spending an entire year in space at this point in time, which is going to be interesting to see how that turns out. So Tarek, is this the interchangeability of seats part of the plan or is this an Apollo 13 type improvisation to get this it, to fit? 
This is a great question, Steve. It is, in fact, a, an Apollo 13 kind of a, a thing. There actually wasn't room uh, for anything else in this space on the on the Dragon. It's just cargo. So they've had to take some cargo out, uh, find a way to mount the seat liner, and the seat liner fits in like a frame on the Soyuz, and they can they pull it out. And in older uh, crew changes, they would pull out that seat liner, move it to a new Soyuz, and have that uh, that one come come back uh, during visiting crews and handovers and stuff like that. Uh, and so what they've done is they've adapted that for at least one, but they can't get all three of them in there uh, because of the space. They they still need some room to bring stuff back on the on the Dragon. And uh, NASA has said that they're looking at uh, once Boeing Starliner is coming up, uh, some other type of of contingency scenario where they can adapt to all of these going forward in the future. Wow. Great. Well, Steve, this is our, our green comet edition, uh, uh, in terms of like the, our our episode right now. And and there is this comet, comet C, uh, I guess I'm going to have to say it out loud. C forward slash, uh, 2022, uh, E3 ZTF, uh, out there, uh, ZTF that's short for Zwicky transient facility, which I believe is a, telescope in Hawaii, uh, if, if memory serves. And, and I've, I've been seeing a lot about it. We've been writing about it a lot at space.com because people seem to be amazed at how green it is and how amazing it is. But what can you tell us about this, this comet, uh, that, um, that people should really know, like what's like the, the snapshot, uh, for this comet right now in the night sky? I think the the snapshot is if you're old enough to remember actual blackboards in schoolrooms, you know, where you had chalk on a black surface and you have some chalk dust on your tip of your little finger and you touch the blackboard with that chalky little fingertip and you have that little smudge. That's what a comet looks like most of the time, if you're lucky. So so it's there. It's coming into the, the threshold of naked eye visibility. If you have a dark sky, binoculars are better. The path of this thing is known. And so we know, uh, for example, its closest approach to the sun was back on on, uh, January 12th. Uh, Its closest approach to the Earth will be on Wednesday, February 1st. Uh, But there will be a couple of other opportunities to look for it, maybe if you have binoculars and a less than ideal sky. On February 5th, the comet passes near a really bright star called Capella, which is at this time of year from mid northern latitudes in the evening primetime hours, almost straight up. It's very high. It's it's like the brightest thing up there except for the planet Mars. Get to that in a moment. So on February 5th, the comet's going to be close to this star. So if you can get your binoculars on that star and get it focused, then look for a little fingertip smudge somewhere in the vicinity. The problem is the moon is full that night. So that might light up the skies <laughs> and wipe out anything that's really dim. However, five days later, the comet will have moved on, uh, maybe a little intrinsically fainter, but it'll appear next to Mars, which is the creepy bright orange thing that's high in the sky right after dark, uh, as seen from mid-northern latitudes right now. And this is February and, 10th. Is this right? is February 10th. And on February 10th, the moon doesn't rise till around 10 o'clock. So that might be a good time. So if you can get your start your binoculars on something obvious and easy to see and then look for the really subtle uh, fuzzy thing after that. Then February 14th, Valentine's Day, the comet appears near the reddish star Aldebaran, which is also high in the sky. It's about the same color as Mars, but a little fainter. Mm-hmm. And so uh, if you want to see it, I mean, you, there will be the headlines, not caused by you, but you'll see them out there on the internet. You know, this thing's going to light up the skies. You need to buy a 4995 telescope right now and prepare to be dazzled. Your sky just got a lot greener and fuzzier, but that's, that's not what to expect. You, you want, you want to look carefully and, and what's charming and weird about it is how much it moves from one night to the next. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's that's a great place. I was going to say, yeah, that's a great, a great, a great kind of calendar place to start. So you've got this, uh, you've got February 5th where the start, the, the comet will be near Capella. That's a, a nice landmark, uh, to look for. Uh, you've got February 10th where it's near Mars. Again, Mars is really bright in the sky. Uh, so that, that's another, another good, a good tag tagline. And if you're wondering how dark your sky is, or if your sky is dark enough, you could uh, go to darksky.org and look for some good spots that might be near you, uh, uh, in the, in the country or, or your lo- location. Um, to try to try and spot uh, spot the the comet, but I, I did want to ask Steve. You, you mentioned that the orbit of this 
uh, is known, and I've seen a lot of numbers uh, going out there, but the, the common one is that, you know, the last time we saw it pass by Earth was 50,000 years ago, and, you know, the, it, was, it was the Stone Age, and I would assume that means that we're not going to see it for another 50,000 years, and I'm just kind of curious how we know that, uh, that it takes that long, and, uh, and should, that, should that make us sad that if we miss it this time around, we're not going to get a chance to see it again? Well, it's an example of one of those uh, very long period comets that spends most of its time living way, 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 way the heck out there beyond uh, uh, Pluto in what's called the Oort cloud, named after the astronomer Jan Oort, who inferred that it might be out there by studying the statistics of a lot of comets and finding there was a, 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 um, a lot of them that had these very long periods. Um, so there will be other comets. Uh, so this is another thing that the headline can be a little hard to interpret, you know, once in a lifetime. Yeah. For this comet, <laughs> uh, um, but there will be others and there have been others that many of us might remember going back over the last few decades. Um, so, uh, the, the, the way it's known is that as soon as one of these things is picked up by say the Zwicky transient facility, which I looked up, it's a, it's a it's a very wide field camera attached to the 48 inch Schmidt telescope on Palomar Mountain, and it photographs a huge piece of the sky at once and can cover the whole sky in a couple of nights. So this is this is a new dimension of astronomy in the 21st century is what they call time domain astronomy, where you survey a large area repeatedly looking for changes, or you have you know, some kind of AI program, or you have citizen scientists looking for changes, and that's how new comets and asteroids are going to be picked up. Um, so you get, uh, you, you observe it at a few different times, and using trigonometry and knowing how the Earth is moving in its orbit, so how our viewpoint is changing, then uh, the celestial dynamics experts can put together, okay, what, what like a segment of this orbit. And if over a certain amount of time the orbit is curving in this particular way with this particular speed, then Newton's laws will tell you the rest of the orbit and tell you that the whole thing is a 50,000 year loop. So, um, and this is really relevant when you get into the world uh, later of uh, planetary defense, where if we see mm -hmm. something that's not going to be just a nice comet in the sky, but something that's a real threat, the more measurements, the better. That allows uh, uh, the celestial dynamics people to refine their uh, measurement of what the rest of the path is. So, so this is a cool thing about gravitation, uh, except that comets can deviate a little bit. We could get into that more later. Um, but in general, if you, if you know some of the path, then you can extrapolate the rest of the path, the assuming path. you know all, the, assuming you know <laughs> all the forces acting on the object. It, all, it always comes down weird. to... <laughs> I was going to say it always comes down to math, right? <laughs> for, uh, well, for what you can see and how you can extrapolate it. Though. And, and what, what do you know and what do you not know that you don't know? So mm -hmm. comments are a little, comments are a little weird. So, so, um, whenever we talk about comets, we sometimes talk about the idea that the, you know, the tail of the comet, the coma of the comet, the fuzzy part that we can see is large and diffuse, but it all comes from this small object called the nucleus, which may be only a few miles across. And the usual term that's used for the nucleus is a dirty snowball, that that's the picture to have in mind, that you have frozen water, frozen carbon dioxide, other gases that are so cold they're frozen solid, mixed in with dirt, and this thing spends most of its time so far from the sun, so cold that it doesn't do anything. But when it gets near the sun, the sun's heat turns some of the gases, uh, the, some of the ices directly into gases. Those spew out from the comet, throwing particles of dust with them. That makes the comet's tail or tails and can also act as a jet that can alter the comet's path as if it had a little rocket engine on it. Huh. And this came up because... Uh, so when you when, when you read article about article about this, you'll often see the the American astronomer Fred Whipple suggested the <laughs> dirty snowball idea, and he did. But I looked it up. It was not just Fred Whipple sitting on a Friday afternoon with his feet up on the typing table in a brewski saying a dirty snowball. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> I looked up his original papers from 1950, and there are three papers, and the first one is like 20 pages of fine print called the acceleration of Comet Enki. So Comet Enki is a comet that goes around the sun about every three years or so. 
But mm -hmm. astronomers had noticed for a long time that it behaves in a non-gravitational way. There are slight deviations in its orbit from what Newton's laws of gravity would predict what is going on. And so he, I have the paper here in front of me here, uh, goes into this theory of if this thing is what he calls an icy conglomerate, could that make the comet be a natural rocket that would cause these little deviations? So he doesn't just say, that sounds pretty good. He's got his <laughs> introduction, uh, let's see here, and then he's got uh, properties of certain molecules, and then section B, the problem of heat transfer, and then three pages of equations on heat transfer through multiple layers, and then uh, the heat, uh, time lag in heat transfer. How long would it take for heat to make its way into the, because if the comet nucleus is rotating, then the side that got heated by the sun might not become a rocket until it's facing the other way. And it could, mm -hmm. you know, uh, alter the comet's direction in another way. Then we have the luminosity law and uh, acceleration of Enki and other comets and more equations about how how plausible this could be to pursue, pr produce the observed alterations in the orbits. And that's just paper number one out of three. So <laughs> it was really a little more to it. <laughs> a detailed argument for why this should be true. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so when you look at the tail or the, the head of a comet, or there can be two tails, one made out of dust and one made out of I was gas. Ask that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you're looking at little natural rockets that they don't make huge changes in the path of the comet, but enough that that people who are really watching, if you if you put in to your equations only the laws of gravity, you don't get the complete explanation. Yeah, and I I wanted to, let me just have a big correction because I, I mentioned at the the, the top here that um, that the the Zwicky uh, facility w may have been in Hawaii. Clearly, I was wrong. You you called me out. You said it was in Palomar. That's it's a, it's in California. <laughs> so uh, so mea culpa to all of our listeners in California. The, and the, folks the, at the name doesn't make it obvious. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then but the Zwicky too. What a character. <laughs> <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, just for, for folks that might be wondering about where in the night sky this comet was, uh, NASA did put out uh, an announcement actually about the start of this month uh, where they kind of had a, it, it tracing its its path across the night sky and and they they were kind of telling people to look towards their northeast overall. Now the milestones that uh, Steve that you you uh, the, the the most with the landmarks with the Capella and Mars I think are a lot easier to understand. Um, but overall NASA has you know is advised folks that it's kind of going in a line across the northeastern sky between the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, uh, if, you, if you've got star charts. Um, but uh, one of the big things for this comet, you mentioned the tail, and that there are two tails. There's like a, an ion tail, right? And then the, the gas and dust tail, if that, if right. that, uh, and, um, and, and so I've seen a lot of people talking about how gorgeous this tail is and the telescope pictures we've been seeing and, and how green this, this comet is. And I was wondering why, you know, you, you mentioned that it, it would look like chalk on a dust, uh, uh, dust on a chalkboard uh, to most people, but why, why, what, what gives the comet its green color? Like what we're seeing in these photos, uh, on the internet that people are saying that they're, they're catching. Well, a com a green has shown up with some other comets and it's usually associated with a molecule that has two carbon atoms in it. So it, and that tends to radiate at that particular color. So mm -hmm. carbon and a lot of other, you know, substances are in there in the dust and it sort of depends which one is being most excited by energy from the sun. Um, why this one is greener than the average comet, I guess we will hear more about it as, as uh, more measurements are taken, but that's mm -hmm. the usual source of the green color in comets is this uh, uh, molecule of two carbon atoms. And and you mentioned that there are two tails then uh, to it, and and we've seen some reports that, uh, you know, there was a recent solar storm actually this week that may have stripped off part of the tail of of this comet. And what why would there be two different tails that you can see instead of them overlapping where they look as just one tail for any comet? Right. Well, if you have a if you have a gas tail, and it, so the, a gas tail or an ion tail, so ions would be little atoms that have an electron added or more often removed, so they're electrically charged single atoms, they're going to be more responsive to pressure from light from the sun. 
And, and there, that's the one that's going to reliably point away from the sun because those little atoms are being driven by sunlight. But as that gas is coming off, it's also bringing dust with it. And the dust is just sort of left behind where the comet used to be. So the dust tail might curve quite a bit over the previous uh, path of the comet. And those of us old enough to remember Comet Hale Bop back in the 90s, mm -hmm. that had two very distinct uh, tails that you could see. So this is a fairly normal thing for comets is, is the two different tails. And so a storm on the sun, I guess, is going to affect the ion tail more immediately, the gas tail mm -hmm. more immediately. Um, and and I, I just I saw before, just, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I remember driving out to the California desert to try to see Hale Bop <laughs> when I was uh, in Los Angeles. So, um, um, you know, should we be afraid of this comet, Steve? I mean, aren't, aren't comets like harbingers of doom and destruction throughout history and everyone was afraid of them? Um, I, the, the short answer is uh, maybe in the old days. I mean, if you have a really <laughs> bright comet, if you if you remember those bright ones from the 90s, we had Hale-Bopp and Hyakutake, which came out of nowhere yeah. very, very suddenly. Suppose you you know, don't have the benefit of listening to this week in space and you are not expecting this thing and you live in a world where when it gets dark, it's really dark. Uh, that might look pretty creepy and you might wonder what it means. Um, in our modern times, the, the, the paths of comets are mapped out well in advance. Um, there is quite an operation, and actually this is a priority for future uh, planetary scientists, called, uh, 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 um, an endeavor called planetary defense, uh, in which the goal is to spot things like comets and asteroids that might pose a threat to us many years in advance, if possible, and extrapolate that orbit uh, in time to find out whether we need to do something about it. But the vast majority of these objects are always very far from us, and we can just enjoy them. Uh, enjoy them. And, and the paths are for, of comets are always um, – the famous comet discoverer, David Levy, said comets are like cats. They have tails and they do what they want. And comet, <laughs> I love it. Uh, comet paths through the sky are always odd, and I guess that's part of their charm. And the reason is they, they're totally random. So you can imagine maybe you're sitting at a table and you have a dinner plate in front of you, and that's the orbit of the Earth around the sun. Maybe you can put a little mm -hmm. yellow – tomato in the center for the sun, and that's the orbit of the Earth. Okay, the orbit of a comet could be coming from any random direction above or below the table, maybe passing near the outer edge of the dinner plate, maybe going inside the dinner plate, going from above to below or below to above. So the, the orbits are totally random, and that's why the sky charts for finding these things are so complicated, and they're whipping around between the big and little dippers, and you got to watch for these moments when they're next to a bright star. Because they're they, they're doing their own thing, um, but remember, it is 93 million miles from the sun to the Earth, and uh, the closest approach of this comet to the Earth, if I looked up this right, uh, on February 2nd is 42 million miles. So that's mm -hmm. that's way out there. Um, not something to worry about. Oh, well, that's good. So everyone, please take note. So Steve says, don't worry about it, but do look uh, up yeah. to see it. <laughs> so, right. So, you know, the, 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 you've, you've kind of gone through some of the dates for, for folks to, to listen to. And just a reminder, that's February 5th near Capella, February 10th near Mars. Um, and you mentioned El, Aldebaran on Valentine's Day. So, you know, take your date out to go look for the comet. Um, uh, do I need any kind of special type of binoculars uh, to, to really get a good view? Is it like the kind I would take on a hike? Would that, would that work? Or what, how big of a telescope would you advise someone might want to, to look for if they need if they need to, to, to check something out. I'd say the, the binoculars you take on a hike w should work if you mm -hmm. are comfortable using them at night. So the advice we always give to people at the planetarium is first be, be familiar with binoculars, try them on something familiar if you haven't used them for a while, like, you know, uh, a stop sign half a mile down the street, get used to what it's like to have them lined up with your eyes, adjust the distance between the two uh, telescopes and the binoculars. There's a hinge in the middle. Get that so it feels comfortable and you're not feeling dizzy or getting a headache. Um, there's often a way to adjust the focus of one of the eyepieces independently of the other to get it to perfectly match your particular uh, eyes. And, and um, then learn how to aim it and focus it at something where you know what it's supposed to look like. Then try something easy like a really bright star. If it's in focus, a bright star should look like a dot, not like a circle, not like a comma. 
Um, get it as small as you can. And then another thing that's very helpful with binoculars, especially if you're looking up high, is that if you're trying to hold the binoculars with just your hands, they'll be shaking around, your neck is straining, it, it becomes frustrating in less than a minute. So if you can rest your elbows on something solid like the roof of a car or rest the binoculars on a windowsill or something like that, or many binoculars have a way, if you buy the special adapter, you can put them on a camera tripod, okay, um, which makes them steady. And it's just so much, so much easier to see anything. But, but mm -hmm. if you're outside just trying to hold the binoculars with your hands and looking nearly straight up, straight up, you're bending your neck at a 90 degree angle and searching for something where you don't know what it's supposed to look like, that could be a little frustrating. So if you're not getting it right away, I guess don't feel bad. Uh, it may take a little time. And I've got um, a, I've got a shame, shameless plug is that if you're looking for uh, starter binoculars or telescopes, um, our, uh, my, my friends over at uh, space.com have great guides about what to, what to start with and, and what to, uh, uh, what to, and how to, how to choose. We also just post, posted a, how to view and photograph comments if you like to take pictures of them. So, uh, do check that out. Um, uh, Steve, you mentioned that this comet, uh, swung by the sun on, uh, in, you know, early January or mid January, and now it's coming close by earth. Does that mean it's on the way out? Basically like we've, it's, 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 it's on its swan song uh, for, for the observers on Earth. Yeah, once it's passed perihelion, once it passes uh, perihelion, it's on its way out away from the sun. And so mm -hmm. th the passage t near us on Earth is on the way out. That's part of the uh, grand bye-bye to the inner solar system for another 50,000 years. So as, so it, as it, oh, go ahead. I was going to say it's racing away. <laughs> racing away. Well, we'll all have to wave as it, as it swings by. And if, if folks aren't able to see it, or perhaps they're like us here in New Jersey where it's been raining and cloudy almost the entire time, uh, there's some other stuff going on in the night sky, right? I mean, it's not just this comet that people should, should mention. You mentioned, uh, I think Mars earlier, what else can people kind of be looking at if they're out trying to see the comet, maybe having a rough go of it, or, or they have a really dark sky and they see a lot more out there. What are they looking at, uh, for, uh, for the rest of this month? I would say prime time evening hours at this time of year, if your weather allows it and where I am. So what we got, I, I saw the sky for about like an hour the night before last, and then maybe for an hour, a couple of nights before that. And the last time was in December. But so if you get a, a, a clear break, this is the nicest time of the year to see a lot of bright stars because the Orion region is right up there in the South and Southwest in that prime evening time from you know around eight to ten orion so, the constellation you mean orion the constellation yes mm -hmm. yes i know you guys have orion the spacecraft too um, <laughs> That's right. so, so so orion the constellation famous for the straight line of three stars orion's belt and if you even think you got it you did there is no other straight line of three stars like it anywhere else in the whole sky if you go outside for those, if you're in mid northern latitude, so that's North America, Europe, and so on, Japan, and you're looking south, let's say about nine o'clock, um, let's say three or four hours after sunset, you're looking south, look about halfway up the sky, three bright star, uh, medium bright stars in a straight line, and then there are bright things around them. So Orion has the three belt stars, and then above the belt stars, there are the two shoulder stars, one of which is orange. Betelgeuse, mm -hmm. and then there are the two stars for the feet. If you have those binoculars, you can scan below Orion's belt for the Orion Nebula. This is one of the reliable, non-stellar, non-planet things that you can easily see with your hiking binoculars. It'll look like huh. a faint kind of greenish smudge below the belt in, with a little cluster of stars down there. It's really just beautiful. That, but wait, there's more. So without <laughs> your binoculars, Take Orion's belt, draw a line through the belt that goes down and to the left, and you hit the brightest star in the night sky, Sirius. It's an ancient Greek name that means the scorching one. In fact, you might notice Sirius before you notice anything else. And if you want to know, is that Sirius, see if Orion's belt is pointing at it. Mm -hmm. Then go back to Orion's belt and go up and to the right, and you'll hit this reddish star, Aldebaran, which is in a little cluster shape, well, medium-sized cluster shape like a letter V. That's the Hyades star cluster. And then go farther up and to the right from Orion's belt, and you hit this little silvery smudge in the sky that you first catch out of the corner of your eye. And then you look at it, and you see it's a tiny bunch of sparkling bluish stars. 
the Pleiades star cluster. <laughs> little children, little children love to call it the seven sisters, even though most people see six stars there. And that is one of the best things in the entire sky to look at with binoculars because it just fits. And it's just a dazzling, beautiful blue sparkling cluster. And then after you've done that, come back down to that Hyades cluster that's near Aldebaran and your field of view is just flooded with stars. So this is a great time for looking with no equipment at all. Mm -hmm. And if you have those hiking binoculars, there's plenty to look at in this winter sky, even if you never find this comet. Yeah, I, 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 I hadn't even thought about the stars. I always think about the planets so much, but uh, uh, man, I've got my, 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 my hiking, my little celestrons right here, and I am going to go definitely check out that, um, uh, that cluster uh, tonight if, if the weather holds, because hopefully it looks like it's clearing up uh, outside my window right now. I did want to ask real quickly because you mentioned Mars and, and I, I see Jupiter from my porch and it's awesome to see. Um, and I, we've been talking a lot about Venus and Saturn getting really, really close on, on January 22nd uh, in, the, in the evening sky. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm wondering just about those planets. How often do we, do we get conjunctions like that where these two planets are so close together um, in, in the night sky that make them very easy to see? Well, the, the, so it, it's going to be every, there's going to be a couple of notable event, events like that every year. Uh, mm -hmm. And very often Venus will be involved because it is the planet, a planet that's close to the sun. It's really bright. It covers yeah. a pretty wide swath of sky over a, a 19 month cycle, which is a, a hard cycle to visualize because you see different parts of the cycle in different seasons. And the next time it's different, it's the opposite seasons. It's quite confusing. It gives me a headache sometimes, but, <laughs> but, but you're right. We have, we have a nice array this uh, right now. So we're, we're talking here on January 20th. Uh, if, if I were to go outside just after sunset, low in the Southwest, Venus, really bright, just mm -hmm. above it, much fainter Saturn, then up maybe halfway up the sky, almost as bright as Venus, Jupiter, and then way overhead, Mars. So over the next few weeks, Venus is moving fast away from the direction of the setting sun, and the Earth is moving in all this as well. So Venus is going to pass near Saturn, and, and Saturn will disappear into the glare of the sun. And then Venus will appear near Jupiter, as you said, uh, um, later on. What was that, the mm -hmm. 22nd? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's going to happen. Uh, some kind of Venus Jupiter conjunction is going to happen roughly once a year. Um, as Venus is always around somewhere in that vicinity uh, near the sun and, and Jupiter takes 12 years to make its way all the way around the sun. So it's kind of a slower moving target. So Venus is going to hit it relatively mm -hmm. frequently. So it's, it's a oh. nice, that's yet another reason. This winter and early spring is a great time to just look with no equipment at all. And even if you have a bright city sky, these planets and stars are bright enough to poke through. Well, come for the comet, stay for the stars and planets, you know, for sure. <laughs> that's, that's great advice there, Steve. Thanks so much. You know, I, I did want to ask um, about, um, about astronomy in general, because I know that, um, uh, that, you know, you mentioned kind of at the very top when we we're talking about news, uh, about infrared astronomy the, and, and, and the James Webb Space Telescope. I heard that you had a, a very interesting discussion uh, with NASA's James Webb uh, project scientist, uh, uh, John Mather, uh, about, about funding projects like that to, to look deeper into the night sky. And I was curious what that, what that story was. Well, in my role as a middle manager and department director at the, our museum, I guess I'm magnetically attracted to these management stories. So, so there was an occasion where there was Dr. Mather was in Rochester because there are some heavy optics experts here, including people who tested the optics in the James Webb Space Telescope. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> and somehow I got invited to this. So I was like the seventh wheel at a dinner for six people. And, and I had a chance to talk to him and I said, uh, and he, he, you know, he won the uh, part of the Nobel Prize in physics for organizing the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite back in the 90s or early 2000s, which made the first really close measurement of the cosmic microwave background. This is this uniform glow in microwave light that comes from all over the sky that is the strongest evidence that there was a Big Bang, especially 
after having been measured so precisely by this COBE, COBE satellite mm-hmm. that he helped plan. So, uh, you know, he, he helped put together a giant project that involved building a type of observatory that had never flown in space before, and it worked, and it made a measurement that sort of changed the history of cosmology. So I thought, this is somebody to ask a question to. And he was talking <laughs> about how do, how do you estimate the cost of a space mission, and the way you really have to do it officially is the zero-based budget, where you start with, well, we need this, and it'll cost this much, and then add this, it'll cost this much, and so on. But I remember him saying, you know, another way to estimate is he found that if, if he plotted the cost of a space mission versus the mass of a spacecraft, there was a pretty good correlation. <laughs> mass of, and the Congress would not allow that as justification. But the Kobe satellite came out pretty close to that trend. Anyway, so I came to him and I said, suppose I'm the manager of a project and I have an idea for a project and I've worked through the plan and I've determined that the cost of this project in some units will be three. And I want to go to a funder. What should I ask for? Should I ask for five, knowing that no matter what, they're going to want to cut, just to be able to say they cut? Or should I say, we've worked really hard. We've worn our pencils down to a stub. We are, we, we really think we can do it for three. Please don't cut us below three. And Mather says, you know, well, of course, it depends on the situation. But he says, a good funder will ask you, what makes you think you're so smart that you're sure (laughs) you can do it for three? Why are you smarter than other people who had cost overruns? Um, And we see that, you know, in so many, so many space projects like Webb Mm -hmm. and others, um, where if you're doing something totally unprecedented, um, a certain amount of uncertainty has to be built in. So that's that's my story about the the oh. pearl of wisdom from John Mather. Yeah, and now he's got the world's biggest space observatory in in, in space now, pe- peeling back those layers, uh, those layers of time to see what's up there out in the night sky. And you know, I I did want to ask uh, Steve about uh, the planetarium, and uh, you know, if if, if folks are. Are, are 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 done with their tour of the of the night sky and are, are curious about um about swinging swinging by the planetarium or, or what you've got going on there uh what you have going on online for for ways for them to follow you uh this uh, uh this season well it's so wherever you live support your local planetarium uh because it really all comes down to the local people going to see what they have and ask good questions because that's what justifies keeping the people there and keeping the equipment running uh, so I'm speaking to you from Rochester, New York, which is in western New York, and I have the privilege of uh, directing the Strassenburg Planetarium at the Rochester Museum and Science Center. So if you're anywhere in western New York or you're ever visiting our part of the world, come by. We've got all kinds of different shows going on. Uh, 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 the Sky Tonight, uh, a JWST show, a children's show, all kinds of things. Uh, we're also uh, doing an online discussion group called Coffee in Space. <laughs> that has gone over very well with 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 adult learners. It'll be on Wednesday afternoons starting in February. So look at rmsc.org, find the planetarium section, see if you want to sign up for 10 Wednesday afternoons of uh, talking about space. Uh, we charge a modest fee, but um, it's not much more than what you would spend on the sp- Starbucks for each one. So at rmsc.org, look for Coffee in Space and see if that interests uh, you that's coming up. Great. And, and for you in, in particular, I mean, we, we talked about your, your, your books there. You've got a new book project that's going on right now that we should know about that people should be watching out for uh, coming down the pipeline. I don't have a new, uh, I have of course ideas in my brain, but sky to space is still out there and, and it's on Amazon and the, the real agenda of sky to space is it's a $10 book, you know, and it's, it's a lot of hand drawings and it's the book I wish I'd had when I was 13. Um, and, and, it, the the secret agenda is to teach you how to predict eclipses. And so, we, you know, it was inspired by the 2017 eclipse. And now we have what we're around here calling the big one, April 8th, 2024. 2024, um, that's right. Yes, it I was gonna, huge uh, around here. Uh, round round and, two and, of the great American uh, solar eclipse, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. It'll come from Mexico across us and then into Canada and and uh, Rochester, New York, is right square in the path of totality. Oh wow! And so we want to we want to be sort of the regional advisor and coordinator 
<clears throat> for people who are in this part of the country and want to see it. The weather could be absolutely anything in this part of the country mm-hmm. on April 8th. We'll see. Mm-hmm. But no matter what it is, I mean, I went to Tennessee in 2017, and maybe you've had other people talk about this, but there is just nothing that conveys what it's like. It is the one of the most profound experiences you can have as an inha- inhabitant of this planet is to be a total eclipse of the sun, to be in the path. 99% is not close. I, I, I totally, totally get you and, and agree. I was in Carbondale, Illinois, at the Saluki Stadium uh, at the, the university there. And it was such that, I mean, we had like one cloud in the sky and the sun was in that cloud as totality approached. And there was like a break for like a split second where you saw totality in that ring uh, around the sun uh, when the, with, you know, with the, with the moon uh, there. And, and it was just absolutely spectacular to see it like go in uh, you've got that, that, that moment of totality. And it's so dark that <laughs> it was just crazy. So yes, please listen, listen to Steve and, 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 and get ready. Yeah. Go to Rochester for this. So. Yeah. Whatever you do, clear your calendar from Monday afternoon, April 8th, 2024, and get yourself into the path. You will not regret it. Blow your savings to get there you can be you can be parked next to a walmart you don't have to be anywhere fancy you just have to be in the path there are maps i'm sure space.com has great resources for finding where to go well, just you. get yourself between those two blue lines you will not regret it yeah that's gonna be the best spring break ever i think so well, i we'll gotta keep an eye out on that <laughs> i've only seen one total solar eclipse but it was a life-changing experience and uh, i will not miss that one so I, I second the blow your savings part um <laughs> steve this has been great you guys really knocked it out of the park thanks so much for joining us to talk about this latest bizarre object in the night skies above comet sleeve uh, c forward slash 2022 forward slash e3 parentheses etf and parentheses um, Steve, you've already talked a little bit about your book, which I highly recommend. Uh, where else can we keep track of what you're up to? Well, I do have a website, sky2space.com, S-K-Y-T-O-S-P-A-C-E. Uh, so that's where I have keep some background uh, information on the book and a couple of the other things I've done over the last few years. Uh, so I, I guess that's the best place to go. Or sign up for All Coffee right. in Space at uh, rmsc.org. <laughs> there you go. I couldn't have pitched it better myself, although I was about to. Tark, where can we keep track of your indescribably delicious and incredible life? Well, I am at space.com as always and uh, on, on the Twitter at Tarek J. Malik. Uh, and, you know, fingers crossed on Monday, I will be at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility watching Rocket Lab launch their first U.S. mission. Um, if that sounds like deja vu, it's because we were supposed to do it back in December and they didn't make it. So we're going to try it again uh, and uh, keep your keep your eyes open because we may be coming that, uh, to you live uh, from Wallops for that Monday night. Because you on January 23rd, pardon me, <laughs> has a travel budget, but I've said that before. And of course, you can always track me. Actually, it's because I have a car and I can just drive down there for the day and come back. And that's what it is. <laughs> so. I'll still gas these days and all. Uh, you can always track me at pilebooks.com or at astromagazine.com, also on Facebook, Twitter, and occasionally Instagram. Don't forget to drop us a line at twist at twit.tv. That's T W I S at twit.tv. We always welcome your comments, suggestions, ideas, and we answer all our emails. New episodes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so to make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, give us reviews. Five stars, thumbs up, a big nod, whatever you want. You can also head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. And don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free on Club Twit, as well as some extras that are only available there for just $7 a month. So go check it out. That's the price of an expensive drink at Starbucks. Finally, you can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and twit.tv on Instagram. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Don't miss all about Android every week. We talk about the latest news, hardware, apps, and now all the developer goodness happening in the Android ecosystem. I'm Jason Howell, also joined by Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and our newest co-host on the panel, Wen Tu Dao, who brings her developer chops. Really great stuff. We also invite people from all over the Android ecosystem to talk about this mobile platform we love so much. Join us every Tuesday, all about Android on twit.tv.